since we started our prayer time last week. And then I had some questions from different individuals who will remain unnamed, right? <laughs> about prayer. You know, just there's some basic questions that we have about prayer. Like, for instance, I'll just throw it out. Doesn't God know what he's going to do? So why should we pray? He's going to do what he's going to do anyway, right? So we pray and we say, oh, Lord, we want this to happen. But wait a minute. Do we change God and what he's going to do? Or is he going to do what he's going to do anyway? Those are interesting questions. You're all looking at me like, what's the answer? What's the answer? <laughs> he knows what's going to happen and what he's going to do. But I do believe prayer makes a difference. Okay. Very good. He changes us. Uh, and I do believe he listens and it opens doors. I remember you all have to, it wasn't a Elijah that prayed for 30 days and went mm-hmm. The angel finally came. He said, "Why did it take so long? Oh, I had to fight Lucifer again." Yeah, Daniel, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah he was. Said, Open doors. Yes. So God can be swayed. Well, I don't know that it's swayed. I think He's waiting for us to talk to Him about it, hmm. and then for us to listen to Him ah. and get in line. Yeah. You know. It's a partnership. In, in, in Revelation, uh, it talks about, uh, while we're talking about, you see uh, what's going on in heaven, and, uh, and there's the saints holding their cups. The prayers of the prayers, saints. Prayers yeah. of the yeah. saints. Mm-hmm. Yes. History was changed, if you read the book of Revelation, um, and that's just one example. History was changed, or the, the way it went was changed because of the prayers of the saints. They were brought before the Lord, and it changed. Now, here's the question. Did God just say, oh, they're praying. I guess I shouldn't do what I want to do. I'll do what they want to do. Uh, don't think so, right? God is still God. So how, how do we reconcile those two things? Maybe that's the question. If God knows, should we pray about it? We look at the pattern. I think prayer is important because it changes us. Uh When you're face to face with your father, having that conversation. Yeah. He doesn't change. Yeah. Okay. I'm open to all kinds of suggestions here. Comments. um, God was really upset with children in Israel, uh-huh. and he was just going, oh, oh yes, no, he was really, 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 and then he said, but if you only pray and change your ways and repent, I would change my mind. So if, if we pray and change our ways, maybe we'll get Right. And when we went through the book of Judges, remember, God said he would fight for the Israelites. He would fight. He would drive the inhabitants out of the land. But it didn't happen. He didn't. They weren't all driven out. And there were times when they failed. They went up against Jericho and they stole some stuff or AI. And so what's going on? God said he would fight for them, but then he didn't. Well, because their hearts were not right, and God just stepped back and let them see what it would be like without his help. Maybe so they, Maybe they misunderstood what God said. Yeah, but in that, in that case... Yeah, but God had told them, told Joshua, here's what you do. Don't touch any of the garments, the silver, the gold, and yet one guy did hid it in his tent, and so God withheld his blessing. Well, you say, well, God said he was going to help them. What happened? Well, because they weren't right. So God's not going to win the battle for them if they're not walking with him, if they're in disobedience. Well, that guy had yeah. to be taken care of. Yes, and, a, and the guy, yeah, 
he lost his family and everything else. There's an instance in uh, Exodus where he wanted to destroy the Israelites uh, because they, they weren't, they weren't, right. uh, they weren't listening to him. And Moses, he did it through, I don't know if he did it through prayer or just talking to God, but he convinced God not to. Right. And it's interesting what Moses said. He said, Lord, we'll be, it'll be a reproach on your name. You've promised to work through our people. And if you destroy us and start over again with somebody else, God can do that. But what are the nations going to think? You know, when God's very people have to be destroyed. And so he pleaded with God for the people. And then it says God repented, which is an interesting thing. How does God repent? When we think of repentance, I mean, we're going down a road the wrong way and we go, oh, that's not right. And we turn around, and we go this way. Repentance just means turn. Well, how does God turn? Well, think about what we were talking about with, uh, in the book of Judges. God's promises were conditional. I will fight for you, but you've got to walk with me and trust me. Yeah. And when man doesn't hold up their part, God says, okay, I'll just wait. Could have been done a lot easier, but, you know, we're going to do it the hard way. We're going to have to learn. Yeah. So these are interesting things about prayer. Um, look at, uh, I wrote down a couple verses. So look at Matthew chapter 6. These verses will kind of help us get our thoughts going as far as prayer. And then I like to just spend some time praying. <clears throat> So Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is talking about um, people that are not walking with God. Verse 7, Matthew 6, 7, uh, the people that did everything for show. And look what it says. But when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen. For they think they will be heard for their much speaking. What's that mean? Well, Jesus makes it clear, look, God doesn't hear you anymore because you raise your voice or because you speak, you pray a long time. That's not the key. We're, so we're going to actually get to what is the key of, to prayer. Is it the words you use? Is it the amount of time? Is it the volume you use? I know my wife and I had a conversation one time. We were at a church that was a little more lively than I'm used to. And it seemed like the louder they got, the more they thought God heard them. And we were like, uh, you don't have to yell. I, God can still hear you. Well, anyway, that was an interesting conversation. But look at verse 7. It says, they think they'll be heard for their much speaking. So Jesus says, don't be like them. That's not what God's looking for is loud or volume or amount of words. <clears throat> Be not therefore like to them, verse 8, for your father knows what things you have need of before you even ask. So it's not like you're trying to inform God, right? Oh, God didn't know that I had, an, I had a problem. So I better tell him and I better use a lot of words and I better be pretty loud. Is that what prayer is all about? Well, Jesus makes it clear here, right? He already knows. So. And remember, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, teach us to pray. And so he taught them to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, you direct your prayer to him and you go through the different parts of a prayer. Yes, that's true. <clears throat> Hannah didn't even open her mouth. Yeah, that's true. That's and right. speak. And God answered <laughs> But then in Philippians, chapter 4, go to Philippians. When Jesus makes it clear that the key to prayer is not how loud you speak or how many words you use or where you do it, in public or private. Philippians chapter 4, I think it's verse 6. Let me read this. Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing. That means don't be anxious. But in everything by prayer and supplication... With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 
Okay, put that with what Jesus said. Paul says, let your requests be made known. Tell God your requests. But Jesus says, but God already knows what it is. So why would Paul tell us to tell God your requests, but then Jesus says, but God already knows it. So is it a waste of time to tell God your request? If he already knows it? Why shouldn't prayer just be like, dear God, you already know everything. You know what's going on. Amen. <laughs> would, that be a, would that be a legitimate prayer? We don't deserve it. We're in a hurry. When you're in a hurry. Like a real telegraph prayer, right? You just keep it short. Yeah. <laughs> right. We don't invest ourselves in that I usually start off by saying, Lord, what a day it's been today. Yeah. And then go from there. <clears throat> Go from there. Remember when Jesus met blind Bartimaeus? He walks up to him and he says, what do you want me to do? And blind Bartimaeus says, I want to see. So Jesus healed him. Now think about that. Didn't Jesus know he was blind? Didn't Jesus know he wanted to be, to see? Yeah, but he gave him the opportunity to verbalize that. And then and ask God. And ask so you see how, I don't think we have to understand all of the intricacies of God is sovereign, he knows everything, I have to ask. But somehow those two things come together. So Jesus walks up to a blind guy and says, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind guy could have said, well, you're God, you already know, so why should I ask you? Um, what if he said that? <laughs> right, well, right. There's a level of, of respect that uh -huh. God is offering us. Yes. Um, also, we are short-sighted, and so as long as we're comfortable, we don't remember that comfort and that grace comes from God. Mm. So, you know the picture of Christ standing at the door, and there's and he's knocking, but there's no door. Uh -huh. Go ahead and read it. What's it say? It says, And the peace of God will surpass yeah. all understanding will guard your hearts and mm. your minds in Christ Jesus. So you go to him, you see that you let the Father know what's going on in your heart, and he'll give you that peace. Okay. I think that the prayer is more about us. Uh -huh. So there is a benefit to praying. Yes. You, you give it to him. You give it to God. Remember when Peter was walking on water? Jesus. And when he took his eyes off Jesus, he was sinking. Peter could swim because he we saw that he swam another time. He could swim. But he reached out his hand and said, Lord, help me. I mean, that was a prayer, you know. But it was in essence saying, I'm sunk. I can't do this myself. This is something I can't. I've got to turn to him about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Go to Luke chapter 11, because um, Sherry, I think it was, talk, started with the Lord's Prayer. Let's look at that, and I want to show you a context here that we often miss. We, we take this, Luke chapter 11, we take the Lord's Prayer, and we just pull it out, and we look at it as a, as a prayer, but we forget the context of, of what went on around it. So Luke chapter 11, 11, 11, 11 1. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Everybody see it? And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, this is Jesus, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So John the Baptist taught his disciples. Jesus did as well. 
<clears throat> and he said unto them, so here's the model. Okay, follow along. When you pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven. Who do we address it to? God. Hallowed be thy name. We honor him. He is holy. Right? Thy kingdom come. In other words, God's plans are supreme. His kingdom is what we're all about. He's in charge. Thy will be done as in heaven, so on earth. In other words, we're saying, Lord, it's our desire that your will be accomplished. On, in, as it is in heaven, you've already decided it, but make it happen down here. <clears throat> Give us this day our daily bread. There's the first petition. The first part of it is just honoring God. It's recognizing who we're addressing. Then it says in verse 3, give us this day our daily bread. We're asking. Interesting that he doesn't ask until he fully acknowledges who he's talking to. You know, if we say, dear Lord, I need this. Well, be careful. We've run to a petition before we've spent time recognizing who it is. You hear what I'm saying? All right. Forgive us our sins. We're recognizing that we got dirt on our feet. We got to get cleansed. We walk through a world where there's sin. <clears throat> Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Wow. If we were to forgive others the way God forgave us, we'd do a lot more forgiving, wouldn't we? Instead of holding grudges. Because God doesn't hold grudges. He's forgiven us completely. So in the way that we have been forgiven, we will forgive. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Lord, there's a lot of temptation out there. There's stuff. I want to walk before you in holiness. Deliver us from evil. Now there's the Lord's Prayer. Now the other one of the other ones says, For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. That's like the ending of the prayer. So what you have is, think about a book. A book has two covers. The first part of the cover is honoring God. Then you have the petition stuff in the middle where we live. We, we need food. We need to be protected. We need to stay away from evil. And then the last cover is, for thine is the glory and the power forever and ever. You know, amen. So we're glorifying God on both ends. And the middle part is our part. Yes. I think it's quite interesting that we say our Father which or in heaven instead of our Father who or in heaven. Okay. Um, which doesn't sound like the way it works. <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah, that's the old English. Um, the who is the more personal pronoun. <clears throat> but, yeah, I'm not sure. I'd have to look into that and see why they use that. Not a misprint. Yeah. No. Now, that's the prayer. But... That's not all Jesus said. If you have the red letter edition in your, of your Bible, you'll see Jesus kept on talking. Why do we stop here? We go, oh, that's all we need to know about prayer. Uh-uh, look at verse 5. And he said unto them, now this is right as he's teaching them to pray. He gave them a little format, but then he gives them an illustration to help them understand it. Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is in his journey, has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not, the door is shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. So you see the situation? Jesus just got done telling them, this is how you pray. Now let me tell you something. You have a... You have someone come to your house and you're running to your neighbor and asking for some bread. You've got to feed your friend. And the guy says, I'm in bed. Verse 8, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend. Yet because of his, now the old English yeah. says importunity. Mm -hmm. What's your Bible say? Any other version? Persistence. Persistence. He will rise and give him as many as he needs. Yeah. And then it says, verse 9, I say, ask and it shall be given. Wait a minute. When did he teach them to ask? Well, he taught them in the prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. 
Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Those are the asking parts of the prayer. And he's now saying, here's an illustration. You need something from your friend, and you know what? You're just going to keep knocking on that door until he opens the door, and he's finally going to open it and let you in. Because you were persistent, because you didn't give up, because you showed by your action that this is important, your friend's going to give you some bread. Then it says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. For everyone that asks receives. Ask. It's interesting. It's in the present tense. Whoever keeps on asking. It's not ask once and it's over. It's a continual thing. Whoever is asking. That's literally what it says. Verse 10. For everyone that is asking receives. And he that is seeking finds. And to him that is knocking, it shall be opened. What's the point of this whole thing? Jesus is saying, look, I didn't give you a little model of a prayer that you just say, boom, 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 boom. Okay, done. Close the book and I'm out of here. No, I'm giving you a model and you have to be persistent with this model. Are you following me here? Don't take it out of its context. He doesn't say just whip through the prayer and go on your way and everything will be hunky-dory. Satan, hail Mary's. He says, I'll tell you, I'll give you the model, but you better be persistent in this. All right. Now, what do you think about that? It's comforting because sometimes I feel like I enjoy God. But over and over and over. It doesn't have to be flowery words. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He cares for us more than we care for our children. You know, I'm glad you said that, Sherry, because look what he says. Verse 11. For if a son, he's still talking about prayer, folks. If a son will ask bread of any of you that is father, will he give him a stone? Listen, how, how insignificant is bread? Now, I know somebody made bread tonight that was delicious. But it's a small thing, isn't it? Bread. We're not asking for an automobile or a tractor or a boat. We're asking for a piece of bread. What's, what's Jesus saying? He's saying, folks, it doesn't matter how small or where that's going to go. If it's going to go in your mouth or you're going to wear it or you're going to drive it. It doesn't matter. Don't be afraid to ask. If a son will ask bread of his father, will he give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a, sor a scorpion? Folks, this is basic stuff he's asking for. These are kids asking their dad for something to eat. And he says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them and ask him? Holy Spirit is the greatest gift. So what he's saying is, look, you as a parent, when your kid comes to you and asks for something basic or someone you know, a friend, asks for something so basic and you don't give them something that's going to hurt them, what do you think God is going to do? Okay, now remember, this is the context of giving a model of prayer. All right, so I'll repeat it. I know I've said it before, but what he's trying to do here is not God is not impressed with our words that we say. He's not impressed with the form necessarily. We might get these things out of order. What if you say, give me bread before you say, hallowed be thy name. Is God going to be offended? Because he gave you an order, right? He gave you a little model of how to pray. God's not that concerned that we get it exactly right. What he's looking for is the faith in our heart. Because if you have the faith, you're going to keep on. This guy, and he, that's why the illustration, he had a good friend. And he knew that if he just kept on knocking, that friend would open the door and give him some bread so he could feed his friend. He had a good relationship with a friend, and he knew that if he just kept on knocking, he would get it. The most uh, amazing thing about a prayer is when you ask for healing. <clears throat> and uh, that healing comes or you see it in somebody else that you pray for you see that healing and uh, I think uh, 
Without asking the Lord for, for healing, he's not going to do it mm-hmm. until you ask. And, uh, yeah, okay. keep knocking and he will. But I think uh, where you see it the most is in healing. Yeah. Now, does that mean every time we pray and ask God for healing, he will do it? Well, that's why Jesus made it clear. Look at, go back to the, the prayer. He said, thy will be done. Okay, so think about this. This struck me the other day when I was thinking. Jesus isn't teaching us to pray to God. He's teaching us to pray with God. God's will is already determined. What we have to do is get in line with what God has already determined. We're, we're being taught to pray with him. Yeah, we're praying to him. I understand that. But his will is already determined. So our hearts need to be in line with what God has already determined. All right? But balance that out. I don't want to go too far in one direction and say, well, God's already figured it out. So I, you know, what do I have to say? No, because he encourages us to bring our petitions to him. And just like blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do? Maybe God's waiting, waiting for us to show that we really mean it. We say it once and we close the book. Does that mean it? Does that show we mean it? No, we got to be like that persistent friend and just keep knocking and knocking and knocking. Now, can we move? There's a there's a a preacher when I was growing up, John Avanzini, a really interesting guy. He had some interesting ways. He wrote a book called Moving the Hands of God in Prayer. And he went a little to one extreme. I don't think I want to go that far. But he he would say, it doesn't matter what. If you pray in earnest, you can move God to get on on board with what you want. Basically, that's what I'm saying, what he said. But he even went so far as to say, I don't know if he said it exactly, but you can change the will of God. You can change God. Remember what Jesus said? If you ask anything in my name, name. I will do it. What's that mean? In line with what God already wants. Well, sure, he's going to answer. Okay. That's true. Also, I think a lot of times through obedience. Yeah, that's true. I think you can't pray for something foolish and expect to get it, no matter how faithful you are. Yeah. Like God. Please, may I have a brand new car next week? No, you're never going to do it. Well, remember with the Israelites, right? With the Israelites, that God gave them their request, but He sent leanness to their souls. So He said, "Okay, you want that? You're you're bugging me so much about wanting a king." I'm going to give you a king. You're going to be sorry that you asked. So be careful how what you're insistent about. And yeah. what does it mean here, Paul, on verse 13? Right. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to right. them that ask? Well, what Is he I, the answer to all of our prayers? Well, he's the greatest gift. <clears throat> the other Gospels don't say that. They say how much more will your heavenly Father give you Good gifts is what it says. Holy Spirit is a good gift. That's the ultimate. Um, So let's let's just recap what we're talking about. Does God want us to come to him with our request? Yes. Okay. But he already knows what we're going to say. So why should we say it? That's good. It shows our dependence on him because we come to him like a kid asking for something simple, trusting that he's our heavenly father who only gives. James says every good and perfect gift comes from above. He only gives what's good. That's why I often pray nothing comes to us that doesn't come through the hand of a loving God. Nothing touches you that that doesn't come through the hand of a loving God. He allows 
And you say, well, I don't like what's going on. Well, then you, we need to submit and we need to say, Lord, I don't like this, but I recognize that you're God and you've allowed this. Paul, remember, he prayed three times. He's the one that healed other people, but he couldn't heal himself, whatever his ailment was. Prayed three times, Lord, take this away. And God says, after the third time, stop. Don't pray anymore because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there with you because my grace is made perfect through weakness. In other words, you're going to learn things by me letting that stay there that you wouldn't learn any other way. Think about that. God's grace is going to be shown in your life in a way that you would never experience any other way. Now, you and I can't figure that out. We go, oh, wait a minute. Like, you know, Johnny Erickson that dove in a, yeah. in a lake and broke her neck. Yeah. Um, and yet she'll sit there and say, God has used me in an incredible way through my disability. So God knew, I'm just using her as an example, that if she were whole and be able to walk, he would not have been able to use her to the extent that he can use her in a wheelchair to encourage other people. Now you and I go, I don't know about that, but hey, we don't see things as God sees, right? His ways are higher. Isaiah 55, my ways are higher than yours. We have to just trust, submit that he has allowed it. Like maybe in Paul's case, we pray, Lord, take it away, Lord, take it away. And he says, I'm gonna leave it there because I'm using you in a special way with that being there. Yes. Also, remember what Paul was like when he was Saul, and he was hungry. <laughs> and maybe the Lord was thinking, mm, I'm going to hold you off to doing this because this will keep you humble enough to reach out to him. It's a great and thought. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Does he want to see growth in us, though? I mean, if he wants to like, see this prayer stuff that we're talking about, he wants to see us grow up mm -hmm. and, and be stronger and be able to realize that we are growing up and we are yeah. learning his word and what he wants. Uh, yeah, that's why you all said it changes us. As we pray, we become changed. Because we not only recognize who's in charge and we trust him, he is our heavenly father and the things we don't understand, we have to leave with him, but we can still bring them to him. There's nothing wrong with being honest with God and saying, God, this stinks. I don't like this. But there was a man uh, years ago who wrote a book called, his name was Eugene Peterson, I think. He talked about, he brought out something. I remember when I was in college, I read this. He went through the Psalms. Now, if you read the Psalms, it's just a little tidbit to think about. Um, David talks about the morning and evening prayers. In the morning, I do this. In the evening, I do this. David had a way of praying differently at night than in the morning. This guy wrote this book to show us that. And I don't remember it all, but I do remember one thing. Here's what he said. In the evening, whenever David says, in the evening time, I bring my request to God. In the evening, David is basically saying, just complaining to God. The heathen are prospering. The godly are not. I don't, you know, this is happening. This is, you know, I'm being persecuted by the... In the evening, his prayers had to do with a lot of what was going wrong around him. And he just brought it to God and he was honest. But if you read the morning prayers where David says in the morning, Psalm 4 and 5 are examples of a morning, an evening and a morning prayer. You can look at it. In the morning, you know what he prays? God, I want you to conquer my enemies. I want you to do because he was ready to start the day and he was reminding God of his promises. God, you promised that you would be faithful to me. God, you this. Very different between the evening and morning. Now, sometimes we put those together, and that's fine. You can complain to God all you want about what's going on, the evening prayers, and you can claim his promises and say, God, you've got to protect me. You've promised to be my protector as I face this day. So read Psalm 4 and 5, and you'll see David even calls them the morning prayer and the evening prayer. Very interesting. 
Maybe some of you, before you go to bed at night, you need to read the one psalm, that's the evening prayer, and go, wow, David really complained a lot about what happened that day. And get up in the morning and read the morning prayer. What's that, Judge? Oh. I have to read that too with my dad. And um, I've got to read on Psalms every night because I'm to read Psalms. Jojo and I pray every night, but uh, all right. Now, uh, in, in your prayer, too, I, I pray for, for people that were terminal. And I knew in my prayer for those people that he could heal, heal them if he wanted to. Yeah. At the end of that prayer, I would say, let your will be done. Whatever you want to do, Lord, it's your will. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. Yeah. at the end of my prayer, that's usually how I am. Not my will, but yours. Well, remember Jesus, before the night before he was crucified, mm -hmm. betrayed, he said, Lord, if there's any way this cup could pass. Yeah. Nevertheless, remember that? Not my will, but thine. He even told his father he didn't want to be killed. Yeah. Is there any way that this could happen another way? I'm not looking forward to this. He's honest. You say, well, Jesus was honest with his father God. He was. But then he finished it by saying, not my will, but thine. I still submit to the will of my father. That's a hard prayer to pray. Lord, if this sickness or whatever disease or whatever, is there any other way this could be either healed or taken care of? I'm asking you, Lord. Nevertheless, I still submit. To your will, whatever it is. Yeah. Is there a right for wrong to pray? Do you have to pray out loud? No. Oh. So, as long as the intent is there, it's good. That yeah. Remember, we said, God, it's not the words you say or the volume of words or the order of how you say it, it's your heart. He's looking to your heart. And remember the New Testament says in Romans that the Spirit takes our requests and translates them to the Father. Sometimes we don't even know how to pray. Yeah, we go, God, I don't even know where to start. You know, I don't like this. I don't know what's going on. Take my jumbled thoughts, put them together, take them to the Father. He's promised to do that. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Um, you know, I'll feel dead, tired, distant, and Lord God, I just don't kind of get it. And I would be hugging on it, you know, mm -hmm. but it's the obedient act, and, the, and I think the Lord honors that. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember the example of uh, the four men that brought the, the man to Jesus, remember, and they couldn't get in the house. I know this isn't prayer, but it is coming to Jesus. And remember when they took the roof part off and they lowered him and Jesus healed the man. But it says when he saw their faith, not the man that was on the cot, he was probably unconscious. Who knows? Because there's no words recorded of this man. But Jesus says when he, or it says when he saw the faith of the four, he healed them. Now that's a really interesting concept. So what if you can't bring your request to God? What if you're so down or cast down? You know what you do? You get people around you to do it. And God can look at not just your faith, but the faith of those around you. That's why it's important to pray for one another. That's why it's important to get together. We encourage. We, we're stretcher bearers. We hold each other. Make sense? So what Jesus is teaching here in this chapter in Luke is there's, there's a model for prayer. But God isn't looking at the words necessarily. He's looking at the heart. Is your heart... Do you, do you have faith? that you are coming to the creator of the universe with your little request for, a, for an egg or a fish or a piece of bread. How 
insignificant is that compared to the universe? But God takes note. And if you're a kid and your dad's talking, you're going to tug on his shirt. Dad, 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 you know. <laughs> Have you ever seen kids do that? They don't care who their parents are talking to, the adults. They just, they interrupt because they have a relationship, right? They don't care that dad's making, making a real estate deal or something. They're just going to interrupt. Dad, can I have a piece of candy or something? And you go, shh, stop. No, but in their mind, that's real important. And that's what he's saying here. If a son asks for something so insignificant, and you earthly fathers pay attention to that, what do you think God's going to do? So the encouragement is this. Don't focus on the words. Don't focus on the order. Focus on your insistence to prove that you have the faith. You say it once, it probably doesn't prove much. Say it twice, three times, just keep it up. Can I also bring up that there is, there are things that will hinder our prayers, right? Um, that the Matthew 6 section that gives the Lord's Prayer also says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And then in, uh, in 1 Peter 3, where um, Peter's talking to husbands, love your wives, Right? No. Let me let me read it so I don't say it wrong. But the the prayers of the husbands can be can be hindered by the husband's relationship to his wife. It says, let's see. Seven. Three seven. In like manner ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. Who would have thought that a husband who's not honoring his wife yes. is going to have hindered prayers? Mm -hmm. But it's a pride thing, and I think God resists the proud. So he won't hear our prayers when he, we have pride in the way, when we have sin, mm -hmm. when we aren't forgiving <clears throat> others. So there are things that hinder yeah. our prayers. Well, Jesus said one time, if you're on your way to the mm -hmm. temple with a sacrifice and you remember that you've offended someone, leave your sacrifice and go fix it. Go ask forgiveness, then come back. Don't offer your sacrifice if you've got untended business. Take care of that first. That's similar to here. How many saying times, to the men. How many times in the, in the church these days, I'm not talking about the Catholic priests, I'm talking about church, universal, Christians, people who call themselves Christians, even pastors who are hiding a sin and they keep going on and hiding that sin. And then when it comes out, it's like, whoa, that was a Christian. I mean, it's not just hindering prayer, right? It's taking the name of yeah. the Lord with them in the, in the muck. Yeah. If we, if we instead... We're, we're right in prayer. We're, you know, we've had that relationship with God in prayer. Hopefully, those sins would be dug out and disposed of more often, right? <clears throat> we wouldn't be hiding them. So let's go from that point in the communion. Mm -hmm. And you address that. As far as the search your hearts? Yes. Yeah, Paul says to the folks in Corinth, uh, let a man examine himself first, lest he eat and drink of the, uh, the, the juice and the body unworthily. For many are sick and many have died because they've done that. So in the early church, there were people that were coming to the Lord's table to celebrate the death of Christ. And they had similar sins going on. And they hadn't taken care of it. And God says, uh-uh, don't do that. I want to. I want you to mean business. Go take care of what's your what the problem is. Then come to me. So, yeah, that was a serious thing. And, you know, I think today, I don't 
think it's as much where if someone has a, is harboring sin and they partake of our communion time, they're not going <laughs> to fall over dead. But, you know, in those days, God was making a point. This was the beginning of the church. And he was saying, look, we're going to do it right from the beginning. Because you all know how it works. You've heard of vectors, right? I teach you a math lesson. Two points, they start at a point and then they go off in the direction. The further you get from the point, the further apart they get. You have to be right in the beginning. If you're not right in the beginning, you're never going to have a straight line. You're going to be all crooked. Okay, so what a lot of the New Testament, God, that's why Ananias and Sapphira, remember, God struck them dead. He was proving a point. Don't mess with the Holy Spirit, right? Making an example of them. When I was, um, here's a story of my personal experience. Um, when I was a lot younger and I had a real dear friend, girlfriend that uh, was going through some horrible things. When her husband left her, then she got very sick and had epilepsy and just everything was going wrong with her and she's a Christian friend. And I remember walking one night and I was looking over at her house and I was praying for her and I, it just kept getting worse, her problems did. And I was mad at God and was kind of chewing him out like, why aren't you doing anything? And I never have heard a still small voice except that one time and it just said, back off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. and it wasn't mean sounding yeah. but it was very distinct and it you know in other words he had it and he was t and she is and, and, you know he's taken her through to a victory in a lot of ways but you know you get so bound up in it being done the way you want it done and he had to take her stuff like he has to do. Yeah. And I never forgot that. Wow. That's a real lesson. Well, you know, the Bible does say our spirit and his spirit commune. There's, there's a sense in which, maybe not audible out loud every time, but there is a sense in which That's God will commune with our spirit. Can I give him an example of what happened the other morning? <laughs> With your, mother, with your mother? Oh. <laughs> I was laying in bed. I was, you you got to hear this. This is, He's got blew me away. I, we're, I was laying in bed, and her mother calls her every morning, but it's from Maryland, so every it's six, other, three hours three earlier. Three so, like, when she calls us at 6, it's 3 in the morning. Well, no. Yeah. She calls at 6 there, but we're 3 in the morning. So she forgets the time difference. So I'm laying in bed, and it was almost like I heard this voice saying, call your mother. It was 7 in the morning. Call your mother. I rolled and, over I and I opened my eyes, and I said, Kitty, call your mother. And I said, and well, just I'm like call that. my mother today. And then I go reach for the phone, and it's ringing, and it's my mother. <laughs> it's her mother. She was in a pickle because she couldn't, something was going wrong. And the first one to call is Kitty. Now, that is weird. I, I don't know. Don't don't look at me like some super thing, but I believe I'm laying there in bed, and I honestly heard, I honestly heard, call your mother. I heard the voice. It said it to me. But it was, he was saying it to me. He was saying it to me. God was telling me, and I was I rolled out of bed and said, I'm going to call my mother today. I reached for the phone. Yeah, I told her. God was telling me. Well. And he said, today you you should call your mother. I said, I'm reaching for the phone to call my mother. I had already decided as I rolled out of bed that that's what I was going to do, and it ran. So, anyway, that, that has, I don't know if what that has to do with prayer, but. Just a um, coincidence. <laughs> God does commune with our spirits. Yes, you just know, and that's how you know he's real. Oh, I know. And how often do I want to call my mother in law? You know? <laughs> It's not like I look forward to that every day. Oh, she might be listening. She's probably listening to this. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh, brother, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So 
Holy Spirit takes our prayers to God and they're nothing but groans. Yeah. And I think sometimes that's all I have to say when I pray is groaning. <laughs> Those are evening prayers. You're going, oh, what a day this has been. That's all I can do is groan. Yeah. Oh, by the way, um, Luke wrote Acts. Okay. So I am amazed as I read, as we're studying through the book of Acts, there are things that Luke tells us in the book of Luke that he also brings out in the book of Acts because he wrote both books. Okay. Remember Acts chapter 12. We were there a couple weeks ago and uh, James was killed and they arrested Peter. He's thrown in jail. And what's it say? I think the verse, let me look here. Acts chapter 12, verse Peter, therefore, five, Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So what happened? This, this is obviously the evening prayers, if you want to use that, because he's let go, he, he gets out of the jail at night, and the next morning they find out he's not in there. What are they doing? The church is meeting, and they're, they're pouring out their hearts to God. James has just been killed. One of the disciples one of the you know the one who's an apostle they've lost him and now they arrested peter god you've got to do something about this we don't like what happened today evening prayers and what happens god releases peter of course it's interesting he comes to the door right and they, they <laughs> the the young girl that goes to the door she closed the door oh and she goes and tells them, and they're like, he can't be. He's in jail. He can't be at the door. So I don't know if their faith was, well, I mean, we're all fallible, right? It is a human. They were praying so earnestly for Peter that they couldn't see that maybe he was already there at the door. Don't um, bother us. You're great. But the point is this. Luke is the one that told us, like a friend, go to the door knock and get that bread that you need don't give up and what they what's he say the church was praying look at the words he used it says but prayer was made without ceasing of the church to god same thing they're not giving up they're just going to keep on knocking to god Those are commands. Yes. commands. Jesus commanded prayer too. The Bible has a lot of commands for prayer. So whether we understand why or how doesn't matter as much that as if we just obey yeah. when it says to. So my encouragement for us is, and we'll, we'll pray here in a minute. My encouragement for us is, why should we pray if the Father already knows? Because we're commanded to. And before it's, because it's good for us. And because it could possibly be that God's waiting for us to pray before he acts. He may, it may, we don't know his will. But we can certainly pray that God's will be done and wait and see. And let's see what happens. And he may be just waiting for us to pray more. Okay, so that's the encouragement for tonight. Let's pray. Let's pray that this, that our nation Amen. turn their hearts to God. Let's pray for the needs in our body. Let's not give up. Remember, God's not as much interested in the words and the order as he is in the faith that we have as shown by our insistence. And we just keep on praying for his will. So, Kitty, let me turn this off. Can you turn that off real quick? All right. So